All right. Um, I want to start by thanking you, uh, Benjamin, for the introduction, and thank you to the conference organizers. And given that this is our last multi-person panel of, uh, of the day and of the conference, I want to really recognize everyone who's already spoken, and, um, and thank you. I want to, just one other uh, quick note. I've been sitting, as I've been sitting here, I've been thinking that if it were just women speakers, just women sitting at the table, um, it would be enough, it would, you know, dayenu, um, but that I really uh, do think that the, the insights and the interpretations, the analysis that has come through has been um, different and unique and, and uh, really in addition to uh, what's out there in the world of Uber scholarship. Last July, not long after I accepted the invitation to present at this conference, I left academia and joined the Jewish communal world as the editor of Sources, a journal of Jewish ideas published by the Sheldon Hartman Institute of North America. I'm a full-time Hartman employee. In addition to editing the journal, I research and teach primarily on topics related to gender and other forms of diversity within the Jewish community and between the Jewish community and other communities, especially in the US, and on the construction of Jewish identity. I am never entirely kidding or joking when I tell people, as I find I often do, that the largest difference between my old job and my new one is that I no longer need to grade papers. <laughs> but ultimately, that's not the most important difference. The most important difference, and this is no doubt not a surprise, is a reorientation in the purpose of research. In the world of my little think tank, Research is justified not only by being interesting, although that's important, but also by being important, relevant, accessible to a broader community of intellectual lay people. And there are, of course, other definitions of important, but that's the one uh, that I find myself working with now. And I think on some level, some very important level, that's really why I left the university. Um, with the hope that I can play more of a role in developing the internal Jewish communal discourse to make it not only richer, but less afraid. And I had all of this in mind, I couldn't help it, as I wrote this paper, which I hope to present, or I'm presenting, as the beginning of an answer to the question of what it would mean for Buber to be a resource for us today, us as people, us as Jews, us as women, as women Jews, some combination of, of those identities or what those uh, circles might encompass. The stakes are higher than I would like. There's a recent history of Buber's philosophy of dialogue being used against women. As journalist, American Jewish journalist Hannah Dreyfus has documented in the lab, uh, just a couple of years ago, Rabbi Sheldon Zimmerman of Central Synagogue in New York for years justified his sexual abuse of women with reference to I and thou, and the notion that these abusive, illicit relationships were a way of reaching God. Although the connection is a bit more diffuse, Mark Gaffney, a mystical Jewish teacher well known in the American context, and also a serial sexual abuser of Jewish women, is also the author of books on Buber. So that's in one corner of my mind. And I wrote with two other works and specific colleagues in mind, and I'd like to name them. And I think we've all been thinking about the current political situation here in Israel. There have been comments made throughout both days of a sort of a certainty as to how Buber might have responded. It's always dangerous to say you know how someone who is dead would respond to the present. But there are some colleagues who are really, um, who are not present today, who've done significant work, and uh, perhaps, Randy, this is where you're headed, trying to build up or build out uh, conjectures of what it might mean to be political in the way that Buber was political. And so I want to mention Sam Brody's book on Buber's theopolitics and the discussion around it. And uh, in particular, in the conclusion of that book, um, I see uh, Brody dealing with the question of whether it's worthwhile, given Huber's relative lack of political success, whether it's worthwhile to be like him, a dreamer and a critic of reality, 
think the question, I mean, for me, I would answer the question, that question with yes. I also have in mind the powerful critique of Rosenzweig and Levinas in Andrew Cooper's recent book, Gendering Modern Jewish Thought. As I read it, um, her book responds to a very specific question, the question, or the same question that in a sense I'm asking, whether key thinkers and key works in the canon of modern, of modern Jewish thought can be useful. Her answer seems a strong no. One by one in her book, Cooper examines masculine terms in the work of Rosenzweig and Levinas, brotherhood, father, son, and so forth, and argues that the masculinity of these terms should not be dismissed as coincidental or the result of the limitations of language, as we have long done, and both with Levinas and with Rosenzweig and with so many other works of the Western and Jewish canons. She shows in painstaking detail that their arguments are really tied to the masculine gender of their terms and that their philosophies rest upon the effacement of women and of gender difference. Uber plays only a small role in Cooper's book. He serves a few times as a foil for Rosenzweig um, or for Levinas. He is, as we all know, a famously unsystematic thinker, particularly in comparison with those two, and that means he's much harder to take apart um, with the sort of precise genealogical unpacking that Cooper undertakes. Uh, Vivian, though, I would say that your speech yesterday was a similar project. Um, as you put Buber's use of a feminine image, as well as images of gender difference, you would put them back in the context of medieval German Christian mythology and used that genealogy to raise or at least imply questions about, critical questions about Buber's view of women. I want to be clear with all of that said that I'm not looking to make Buber into a feminist or to pull a concept from his work that we might add to the mixture of ingredients that shape Jewish feminism, and I'm thinking also of the term of a plurality of feminisms that came up yesterday. But I want to suggest uh, that we can use Buber as a way of sharpening feminist thinking through contrast. So what I'll do today is begin with a discussion of American Jewish feminism, focusing on the theologian Judith Plaskow. I'm then going to turn to Buber's biblical writings, and in particular, his concepts of saga and history in those commentaries, and then offer some suggestions in the final section about how to think with them together. As a movement, American Jewish feminism began in the late 1970s, emerging from within the second wave feminist movement, there's various ways we might date its beginning, but I generally like to point to the emergence of two activist groups, the Benot Esh, uh, the Women of Fire, who have an incredible imagery in their name, but are named for the fact that they met, uh, meet, continue to meet on Fire Island. Um, they are a progressive Jewish women's collective experimenting with feminine God language and other alterations to the Jewish tradition. And the Israt Nashim, which is a Jewish women's group that advocated for an updating of halakha, of Jewish law, within the conservative movement of Judaism. Um, and it's worth noting, for those who don't know, the conservative movement, capital C, of Judaism is actually the middle of the road option of the movements of Judaism. So it's worth, uh, worth making that clear. As an intellectual movement, various articles and then anthologies published in the 1980s articulated a vision of a Judaism in which women played or play leadership roles as rabbis, as synagogue presidents, as full participants in ritual life, a, a Judaism in which, or a Jewishness in which girls and women have access to the same educational training needed to read and appreciate classical Jewish texts like the Talmud as boys and men had had for centuries, and a Judaism in which Jewish liturgy, Jewish prayer, which is there's a set liturgy, uh, might be amended or revised, as well as new ways of reading be developed so that traditional Jewish texts might speak to or from women's experience. Tremendous change has been made in the last few decades in regard to the first two items on that list, access to leadership and education. The third, let's call it hermeneutics, 
it's harder to measure. It's harder to know for certain um, how, how texts are read or whether there's truly been um, a change. Judith Plaskow's Standing Again at Sinai, published in 1990, represents the first book-length work of feminist Jewish theology. It expanded the movement's reach and set an agenda for its activism. Plaskow emerged from the Benot Esh. Um, she was trained really as a Protestant uh, theologian, but ended up, this is the work for which she is most well known and with, to which she's, I think it's fair to say, really devoted her career. The title, Standing Again at Sinai, is a reference to Exodus 19 and the preparations that the Israelites must undergo to prepare for the revelation of the Ten Commandments. God informs Moses how they are to prepare, and then when reporting the plan, Moses famously adds another direction, do not go near a woman. Plaskow reads this on really just the simple, straightforward level, as indicating that in the heteronormative Israelite society, Moses must be speaking only to the men, those who would go think about going near a woman, and that from this we can learn and be certain that the Torah's account of this moment of revelation of every moment is male-oriented, written by men and for men. In addition to being a source of impurity and perhaps danger ahead of revelation, women, it would seem, were absent at a, if not the, key moment of covenant making. Are they really Jews? Plaskow standing again at Sinai insists upon asking, or insists upon responding to this absence by asking, what was it like to be a woman at the time of Revelation? Plaskow's book, her agenda, is divided into sections addressing Torah, the people Israel, God, and then, in addition to this classic uh, triad of Jewish theology, sexuality. I'm going to focus today on the first section, Torah. Um, I have a sort of a lengthy uh, quotation. Um, I tried to cut it, but I think it's, it's helpful. It'll give you a sense, not only of her argument, but of her voice. She writes, the androcentric bias of our sources and the patriarchal nature of the cultures from which they sprang means that much important information about women has simply been lost or was never recorded. Part of what we need to know, we may, with skilled probing, recover, but the rest will need to be imagined. But even if it were not the case that the sources are sparse and unconcerned with our most urgent questions, feminist historiography would still provide only a fragile grounding for the feminist transformation of Torah. For, as I suggested earlier, and the historical examples underscore, Historiography recalls events that memory does not recognize. It challenges memory, tries to dethrone it, it calls it partial and distorted. History provides a more and more complex and nuanced picture of the past. Memory is selective. We were slaves in the land of Egypt. The Lord our God with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Dot, dot, dot. How do we recover the parts of Jewish women's history that are forgotten? And how do we then ensure that they will be remembered, incorporated into our sense of communal identity? The answer to these questions, she continues, is partly connected with the wider reconstruction of Jewish life. We turn to the past with new questions because of present commitments, but we also remember more deeply what a changed present requires us to know. The issue of reinterpreting the past is preamble to but also follows from issues of contemporary Jewish women's experience. Significant changes in contemporary Jewish communal and religious structures cannot but affect our perceptions of the past. What I'd like to highlight here is the distinction Plaskow draws between memory on the one hand and history on the other. Just a few years after her text, the distinction between memory and history will become a standard part of Jewish studies discourse with the publication of Zachor by the historian Yosef Yerushalmi. Plaskow's point, though, predates his text, and as I'll discuss in a moment, it is already refusing key aspects of the argument that he will make. For Plaskow, Jewish women need access to their ancestors, to the women whose presence has been erased from the Jewish past. There are two ways that this, this path might be accessed, or two forms it might take. The first is history, historiography, 
This is the easier of the two options. While the emerging discipline or area of women's history is revolutionary in its insistence on shifting the focus away from men and onto women, away from the public sphere, and public square and the political sphere and into the domestic space and the social sphere, the knowledge that can be gleaned from the past is limited to the factual. Memory, in contrast, does not obey the rules of history, research, and writing. It is purposefully subjective, immediate and reactive, a snapshot shaped by emotion. As Plaskow's short description already shows us, memory is the stuff of Jewish ritual and identity on both a communal and individual level. Her call for an expanded Jewish memory gives rise, historically gives rise, to a genre of writing called women's midrash among American Jewish feminists in the 1990s. And Plaskow herself started, started the trend um, by writing uh, one of, if not the first, one of the first of these women's midrashim, where she retells the story of creation, giving a large and positive role to the figure of Lilith, um, whom the rabbis had identified as a, as a demon um, whose story was suppressed or uh, buried within the, the standard um, the standard biblical account of creation in favor of the more pliable, more uh, gentle Eve. Midrash, from the Hebrew verb to search, is the rabbinic mode of commentary known from the Talmud and from other texts of the rabbinic period. Most of the midrashim written in the 1990s are better described or, you know, better, even if the writers of them used the word midrash, what they really tended to be were retellings of key biblical stories from the perspective of women characters. Writers imagining themselves in this ancient biblical world, describing what was going on around them, and trying to give an account of emotional reactions. For example, there are midrashim of this sort seeking to provide Eve's memory or Eve's version of taking the fruit from the serpent, Sarah's memory of learning that Abraham had nearly sacrificed their son, and so on and so forth. Anita Diamond's novel, The Red Tent, is a particularly extensive and also particularly imaginative example of this sort of women's midrash. From the story of uh, the rape of Dina, she inverts it, it becomes a positive, we'd say today, consensual relationship, and she puts it into a context of a female priesthood. I'm gonna, uh, I have a, like a paragraph that belongs in the parking lot, as, uh, as I like to say, it's a bit off topic. I wanna to acknowledge, in contrast to this, this sort of trend of, of midrashim, of American midrashim in the 90s, the publication of Dear Shuni, uh, much more recently, a two volume collection of Israeli women's midrashim, which, in contrast to the American version, strive to more closely resemble the classical midrashim of the rabbis. And I mention it in part because that collection of Dershuni is truly made possible by the incredible access that Jewish women, particularly Orthodox and traditional women, have gained to classical Jewish learning. But back to Plaska. Come back in from the parking lot. Returning to Plaska recently for a different project, um, I like to joke, as much as I try to get away from Boober, he keeps chasing me. Um, I was struck anew by her distinction between memory and history, and how these terms echo and also contrast with Boober's use of the terms history and saga in his biblical commentaries. Boober wrote three biblical commentaries in the 1930s and 1940s, Kingship of God, Prophetic Faith, and Moses. Um, in these books, he develops a hermeneutic method that depends on the interplay of two types of narrative within the biblical text, history and saga. The terms are not new to him, but he gives them his own particular definition. History tends to focus on human beings doing ordinary things or expressing concrete ideas about God, about the Israelites, about the world. Such narratives can be analyzed um, with a method that uses linguistic clues to locate and understand these claims in, within an ancient Near Eastern context. So as you, he's borrowing quite a bit from existing um, historical, critical uh, ways of approaching the Bible, philological research, and so on and so forth. 
The second sort of narrative, according to Buber, is what he calls saga, which includes the more wondrous elements of the biblical narrative. Saga also presents what we might call a reality of the past, but it's a reality refracted through the lens of a biblical person's worldview and everything that that person believes to be possible. Oh dear. Um, as Buber writes, he says, I do not mean that the Bible depicts men and women and events as they were in actual history. Rather, do I mean that, it, in its, that its descriptions and narratives are the organic, legitimate way of giving an account of what existed and what happened. I have nothing against calling these narratives myths and sagas, so long as we remember that myths and sagas are actually memories. Where Plasco uses history and memory to describe two ways of gaining access to a lost women's past, for Buber, history and saga are two types of writing already in the text. I don't know that Plaska would accept Buber's argument that there is a historical kernel or some account of what actually happened in the biblical text. Really, nobody does. Um, even in Buber's own time, school, scholars were more interested in the history of the text rather than the history it purports to record. And you won't find religious readers making this sort of argument either. For the liberal Jewish reader, the entire text may be something they'll call divinely inspired, no further distinctions within it needed, and for a more traditional reader, the text is simply accurate, and doubts about facticity pushed to the side. I'd like to argue that Buber's definition of saga, however, is useful. Saga is a type of writing woven into the biblical text, actually in some ways sets Plaskow up, combining them Pascal and Buber, we might say, because the Bible is largely memory and saga, or memory or saga rather than history, and because it is a patriarchal text, what Jewish women today are missing is women's memories or women's sagas, what encounter with God or whatever actually happened, felt like, looked like, and so forth to the women present, how they would express it in the language that they had. What would Pascal say to Buber about his idea of saga? Although Buber championed Hasidic myth as a way of communicating spiritual truths, as has come up many times, he's actually really ambivalent in the commentaries about biblical saga. He never says it should be ignored. He is actually a beautiful reteller of saga. But he's a little defensive. He seems to assume that, the, that modern people, whom he calls the late born, are oppressed, quote, by the merciless problem of truth that they won't ever believe biblical saga and, and will be hesitant about the idea that it has value. Pascal is not ambivalent about memory, as we already saw. The point of memory is not that it's true, and that's exactly what is so challenging about wanting or needing more of it. Even as Buber's writing is flowery and romantic and Pascal's writing is dry and rational, it is Pascal who seems able to straightforwardly say that access to memory is the source of Jewish meaning and belonging. In her view, Jewish women are to connect to the Jewish tradition. Now, um, in or sorry, for Jewish women to connect to the Jewish tradition, now that their feminism has called attention to and increased their distance from it because of patriarchy, they must have women's memory. In his other writings on the Bible, switching back to Buber, in his writings on myth and his retellings of Hasidic uh, legends, Buber expresses an understanding of the power of Jewish myth, of saga, of memory, that doesn't have the ambivalence of his commentaries. There are biographical reasons for this. He was writing commentaries to get an academic job. But at a minimum, in both his commentaries and his other work, and this seems silly almost to say it, Buber understands that the Bible is finished. It is in the act of reading that the text expands. And reading is not an act of adding to the text or supplementing it. It's something different. It's a transposing. As Jewish feminist theology has developed since Plasco, it too has moved in this direction, following trends in philosophical hermeneutics and legal theory. Even Dershuni, which I mentioned above, is not truly midrash so much as it is readings of biblical text by women living between feminism and tradition and searching through their reading for meaning in, the, in that tension and contradiction. I want to return to Yerushalmi for a moment. I mentioned him earlier in passing simply for his work on the distinction between memory and history in his book, Zahor. Uh, 
The book came out in 1994. Yerushalmi famously argues there that the rise of modernity brought with it a break in Jewish ways of relating to the past. In the time of the Bible, the time of the rabbis, and into the medieval period, Yerushalmi claims, Jews and their ancestors related to the past as a story of God's creation of the world, God's covenant making with Abraham and his descendants, the exodus from Egypt, and the giving of the Torah, each event not only remembered but relived during the course of a year of Jewish holidays. In the modern period, writes Yerushalmi, Jews embraced the discipline of history, rejecting memory. God's presence faded as natural and causal explanations reshaped, reshaped Jewish understanding of where they came from, and time became linear rather than cyclical. The past stayed in the past. Some of our colleagues in medieval Jewish history have questioned Yerushalmi by pointing to pre-modern historical chronicles and the like. There was historical thinking before the Enlightenment. What Guber and Plaskow both understood that Yerushalmi did not is that even in the modern period, Jews have remained attached, and today they want to remain attached, to an older form of engagement with the past. Call it memory, call it saga, the biblical text offers something that history cannot. Thank you.